All right, so okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Good evening, everyone. Good afternoon and good morning to everyone, whoever they are and wherever they are. Thank you so much for joining us today to listen to Kelvin Wilson, who is a dear friend of mine from the Netherlands, and he's British. So I'm sure he has a lot to say about Brexit as well, but we'll keep it for another day. <laughs> anyway, so Kelvin, um, he is a resident in the Netherlands. He is an archaeological reconstruction artist with over 20 years of experience. His work is at permanent display at the National British Museum and has also appeared in the National Geographic magazine. He's worked on sites uh, and on projects um, as colorful as the wardrobe of Tut Ankh Amun or the dolmens of Southern Russia. He has been involved in interpretive visualization of the town of Karanis, where I worked for almost a decade. And that's where Kelvin and I met. And I'll talk about that meeting before we start with the talk. Um, he's worked with the University of California, Los Angeles, Wales, uh, he's um, brought to life uh, elements of the past, people of the past. And you know, it's very important. Oftentimes we forget in the reconstruction of the past or of the present for that matter, when we're talking about eth uh, ethnographic materials that we want to present. We have to understand that imagery, the way we build it, it is you know, through our mind, through the artist's hand. And what we interpret is very important because it tells you about what we wanna say, how we hypothesize things. And that's oftentimes uh, sidelined uh, you know, by researchers, which, it, which is not good. It is a very, very important element of what you want to convey to your audience and about your research, because visuals have the power to convince, to, um, uh, create to correlate and I can say so much uh, you know just uh, by thinking about you know what goes into it but you know Kelvin is behind the scenes and for an artist to work on it at that level the minutest of levels looking at shadow light you know the interplay of all these objects with each other is very important and uh, you have to see how how difficult and how important it is so Kelvin and I, we met. You've said it all. Yeah, <laughs> on a rooftop in uh, the beautiful Fayoum. Uh, and we have uh, Ashraf Sobi here, who's right now the director of the Supreme Council of Antiquities in the Fayoum region. We worked, we've all worked together. And I think I was making tea, which was not this one. It was that Indian ginger tea and Kelvin came on the roof and he said, Sonali, can I have the recipe? And I was like, okay, boil the water with the ginger, yeah? And once it boils, put the milk and I have a very specific way of making milk. So those of you who want the recipe, you can just write to me, but it's really delicious. And I'm sure Kelvin is keeping up with the tradition that we started on the rooftop in the Fayoum. And um, yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> and with that, my Kelvin... sinus is burnt out. I drink it. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, Kelvin, over to you for today's talk, which uh, we are you. really looking forward to. And, Thank uh, you very much, Sonali. Um, and at this point, sorry, I'll ask everybody to mute their mics and to uh, stop their video so we have good bandwidth. Uh, and I'll stop my video as well. And, Kelvin, you can. Okay. So, um, the technical thing is now, now I share my screen. And then I play my presentation and now you can see it, can't you? Yes, okay. Oh, Sonali, if you could leave your microphone on just in case I have questions. Okay. Um, all right. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining. Sonali has said it already. I am uh, English, but uh, I've lived in the Netherlands for nearly all my life. Um, uh, what I am, 
by profession is an archaeological reconstruction artist. There are not very many of those, so I'll explain very much in short uh, what it is. I reconstruct what past life looked like for books and for museums and for exhibitions and for television. I'll show you examples of, of what I do. Um, this is where I work. I work at home in a studio. Actually, it's here, of course, where I'm uh, sitting at the moment. It's literally just a, a, a painting uh, studio. When I was a small boy of eight or nine, perhaps 10 years old, I was fascinated by this book. The Children's His Encyclopedia of His History, which was full of these images of these strange worlds that um, were rich in detail, that were harrowing in detail sometimes. And when I got the chance, after I'd done art college, I tried to make this my this kind of uh, imagery my living. And I got to do a lot of the images um, uh, that I had been that I'd seen as a little boy. Um, I'm going to show you a few that I did just for one client in the, in the United States, just to give you something of the width the width of uh, of the material that I illustrated. So I did ancient Greek wars, or Mesopotamian cities. Again, Greek wars. It was probably for one course. Or this, Alexander the Great in Afghanistan. So I did a whole series of illustrations for these people. What I actually do it for, I got asked this question quite a lot actually. What is it actually for? Well, one of the reasons I like doing it is because I get to say something of the world. Um, I've, as Sonali mentioned, I've worked in Russia, I've worked in Wales, which is beautiful. I've worked in Egypt a few times. Um, I've worked in Virginia and Washington in America. Um, and I get to see these things that for me as a child were the wonders of the world. Like when I started out, when I was in my halfway my 20s, uh, I worked on the uh, Tutankhamun textile project and they took me to Cairo. Uh, to work in the, um, um, uh, the storerooms of the Egyptian Museum. And there were crates packed by Howard Carter because they were still, news they were still um, lined with newspapers from the 1920s with fragile but beautifully preserved textiles from the grave of Tutankhamun in. And one of them, after careful study by the Egyptologists on the team, turned out to say that it was actually the coronation tunic of Tutankhamun. So um, this is actually a bit confusing because on the right, you can see the illustration, which I did in 1995, which, uh, uh, which was published all over um, the world. In fact, I did one that uh, made it to the New York Times. Uh, and then a few years later, I got the chance to redo them. And that's what you can see on the left-hand side. Another reason, another um, um, uh, thing I do, what I do is to educate people. So for instance, I illustrated school books. Funny thing about this one, my own children were taught from these school books. I did this for a few years in the Netherlands. And of course I work for museums. So let's turn to the next page. I work for museums. I work for, um, for museums again, sorry. This is, if you're familiar with the Sutton Hoo uh, Royal Burial, 7th century, East England. Um, the National Trust in the, in the UK, they decided, this is about 20 years ago, to build a, a, a new visitor centre. Um, it was such a popular place, it also included part of the archaeological site, that after a few months they actually had to shut it because too many people were stomping the ground. Um, it's considered one of the greatest archaeological treasures of uh, uh, the UK. But when I was invited to the um, uh, British Museum to see some of the finds, in this case, I got to see those little golden roundels on the horse's harness. harness. Um, 
I joked to the curate. I said, I'm sorry to say, but a lot of your visitors will probably have more gold in their mouth than I actually see in this paint. Uh, then this horse was actually bedecked with. So what I have to do in a case like that is to make it all, um, to give it context. So in this case, it's literally the white prints on the horse, um, the shining white prince, prince um, passing the, um, uh, the lowly farmers to give some kind of contrast to make you understand why in the seventh century, um, um, so much, that amount of gold was so um, um, important or seen as such a rich, uh, a, a rich hall. Well, I get to vary, of course, on, the, uh, uh, on everything I do. So later, the same people asked me for another exhibition. I actually reused one of my figures in the middle and um, uh, made this one. Then this again is the Saxons. This is one I did a few years ago for museums in Germany. Uh, this was a massive mural on the wall of the uh, museum. Um, for a Dutch museum. What I'm doing now, I'm just showing you um, um, uh, um, um, a, 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 the variety of things that I did. I'll come to a story about what makes it so special to actually have to do this. But first, this is still all introduction. For National Geographic magazine. So I don't actually always get to travel the world, but I most certainly get to travel the world in my mind. Just one small uh, household question. Sonali, do you mind if I ask you if you could put your camera on so at least I feel that I'm talking to somebody instead of just myself? Thank you very much. It's a bit friendly. <laughs> <laughs> it feels, feels isolating. Thank you. So yeah, it feels isolating. Thank you. Um, uh, book covers. This is a book cover for the University of Cambridge. Um, still to be published, soon to be published, I believe. Um, if this looks different, I wouldn't call this a reconstruction Don. This is based on knowledge that I have about how things are supposed to look in, the, uh, uh, in such eras. But of course, it's made to look beautiful for, because it's a book cover. This is not educational, if you understand what I mean. Whereas this is a reconstruction of a scene that people in Holland know about from old um, uh, engravings, but I'm the one who is supposed to put it in a, a, a form in which people can understand what it would have felt like. And what it is, is that there's in Holland, in the Netherlands, there's a famous Roman fort, which was washed away by the sea and during one short, a few short seasons in the 16th century was washed free again and it was seen on the beach and it was drawn. Um, so my scene is of, if you like, a, a primitive kind of archeological excavation in the 1500s. Like I said, a variety of things. So I also do information panels, uh, including this one, which is at a short walking distance from my house. And um, uh, this is another. I show this one because this will give you some idea of how much material I have to work with if the period is a later one. So if it's, let's say, anything from the Romans onwards into the medieval uh, 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 times, you will, uh, there, there is a lot of material to work on. So there's a whole lot of small objects in here which are found by the archeologists. But if they were not found by the archeologists, I most certainly can find them in art or engravings or, or other collections. There's a lot of material. One small anecdote, by the way, is that um, I like to put my children in, um, in, uh, in my pictures. I have two sons and a, and a daughter of different age. And um, that little boy there in the front, that's my, middle child, my youngest son, when he was still cute. But I'll point you out the other ones when we come back, uh, when we see them. Like I said, my work is used uh, in a lot of different places. So sometimes I'm even surprised when I say it pop up, uh, when they found something new and then they use it in, in this case on a television program. Um, this is one of my latest works 
this is um, for the National Museum of Antiquities in, um, in Leiden in the Netherlands. Um, the painting is only about this big, but they blew it up to about five and a half meters in width. Um, and again, it's a picture um, where uh, it's supposed to, this is an exhibition for families and children. So it's supposed to be very clear in the things that it explains. So you can pick out small items, you can pick out um, the jars, you can pick out the glass, you can pick out shoes, you can pick out um, textiles, all these things you could, in a sense, talk about and educate these children about. And again, one of my children is here in, in, in this one again. Um, I have a boy called Robin. And if you look at there at the uh, top, you can see a robin flying. This is my client in front of another one, that same painting you just saw of the Roman ship at the, uh, in the exhibition. Now, when I started out, this is in the early 90s when I came from art college, I made this drawing for a book probably, I can't remember. When I was speaking to a designer at the State so Service of Archaeology, he said, oh yeah, I like your work. It's got quite some humor. Now, this is the only picture of mine that he had seen. And I didn't know what he meant. And I thought about it for a long time. What is it that he sees in this that I'm not sure I put in? And I realized that, of course, I mean, this is all deliberate on my uh, uh, side. I just hadn't realized somebody else would see it. Is that the um, horizon is tilted. So the perspective that a person looking at this picture has is that of a bird soaring over the landscape. Now that has become a stalwart of my work is the idea that it always has to have a perspective of participation. This kind of work, which is standard to um, uh, archaeological reconstruction artists, the bird's eye view, I kind of refuse them these days, or I certainly don't get them anymore because I refuse them for so long, um, because um, uh, let's say it's a prehistoric landscape. Um, I don't think any prehistoric person ever got up into the sky and ever saw it from that perspective. So I always find those kind of images too distant. But the idea of perspective, in the years after this, I did play with that a lot. And the one that is most uh, well known and notorious, I'm not sure which word, is this one, where I was asked to uh, reconstruct the very well preserved archaeology of a Roman bridge on the northern border of the Roman uh, Empire. Uh, so in the cold Netherlands, called to the Italians, put it that way. Um, uh, and I drew this, I painted this. And at one point, somebody asked, the boss of my client, put it that way, asked to have something Roman included in the picture. And what he suggested was to have a Roman soldier with a red mantle in it, because he said, I don't see anything Roman. Now, luckily, my client defended me in saying, no, that's not happening. Because um, what this picture is about is not about it being Roman, but about what the Romans experienced when they came to the Netherlands, when they came to the cold north. Now, several years later, I was uh, participating in, a, in an online well, I was in, at the University of Southampton in England, but we were online with uh, speakers in America. It was a, a, a symposium. And uh, it was about different ways of visualizing the past. And there was a team in Los Angeles who with money given to them by Microsoft had made a big video wall where you could fly for virtual Sumerian temples. Very impressive as an experience. But when they, when they um, had a competition, a Twitter competition at the end of the conference and asked uh, which was the most successful evocation of the past, this image won. And the reason was, is because people could feel what the Romans felt. So this idea of perspective, this pervades my work a lot. And Sonali has already mentioned it. We met in, um, uh, in the Egyptian Fayum in the desert 
um, where she was working on uh, Karanis, the Roman town of Karanis. Now, of course, all stubbles of walls, but um, some parts rather well uh, preserved. Um, and there was a lot known from earlier excavations of um, what these buildings had looked like. For instance, they had black painting on the inside of the building. They were painted black on the inside. They had small windows which were closed with ro rolled up little mats, but they were very high up. My job, the week or one and a half perhaps that I was there, was just simply to observe and to tell the ex, uh, excavation leader, uh, Willeke Wendrich, what I saw that perhaps they had not seen, because I'm the visual artist, if you like. And uh, on the last day, I made a series of sketches, which I was then to present to the whole team. And I made this one of the interior of a, um, of a, of a house. Um, you can see it's got some dramatic light fall. But one of the things that um, was very noticeable is that these houses had little shrines inside that were plastered white. Now, you can see just from this black and white sketch why that would be. It's because it becomes more visible. Well, this whole idea of trying to put myself in the feet of the people who uh, experience these things that I have to uh, present so we can learn something more. Um, not everybody does that, of course. I mean, if we go to the cave dwellers of prehistoric Europe, this is the norm. This might be an old one from 1970, from that se those series of books that I really loved. But um, I only last week saw a modern illustration that looked fairly similar to this. And what it is, it's a lot of trying to show what people are doing. So you'll see a woman working hide. You'll see somebody uh, lighting a fire. There you can see uh, somebody else uh, sewing clothes so the, the audience understands that these people were more um, sophisticated than we think because they might have had sewn clothes, blah, blah, blah. You see families, this, it's a whole set of small educational points. But I don't believe that any of you believes that they're now inside the cave. So when the teaching company again in America asked me to illustrate uh, Lascaux Cave, the famous Lascaux Cave in southern France, with the, the hall of the bulls, uh, where, where the biggest painted animal is four and a half meters uh, um, um, in size. What I remembered was my own experience of going to the replica cave, because the original cave is shut to the public now, uh, the, the perfectly executed replica cave, by the way, and being impressed by the scale of it. So when I got to illustrate Lascaux Cave, what I didn't illustrate was what was going on, but again, what it felt like. To be honest, I could put this picture next to photographs that I took in the cave and it would look rather uh, uh, similar. Um, the whole point of it is that I'm not trying to um, um, make a show place of material culture. The only material culture you can actually see in this image is that the man has a light in his hand. Now what they found in Lascaux Cave are these little limestone lamp holders. You put oil in a wick in and then you would have a little lamp. So that is an actual thing that they found. The client asked me to do a second version of this, which had musicians playing mammoth skulls and people painting. I did that, but this is the better version because this is the, um, the, uh, the base experience, if you like. Now, another thing particular to how I, and we'll come to that in the end, like I said, how I um, portray uh, the prehistoric era of which we know relatively little, um, comes down to um, uh, me realizing that um, I had a pivotal experience, a forming experience when I was 17, 18 years old. And it came, it led me not to what I do 
or for who I do it, but why I do it. This is me. 18. Don't laugh, Sonali. I can see the smile. <laughs> Um, when I was 17 or 18, I met an elderly lady and the mother of one of my uh, married into the family uncles who told me that when she was five years old, she had sat on her father's shoulders and watched this. A funeral in February of 1901. And the funeral was that of Queen Victoria. Now, I don't know if that started or if I already had uh, this fascination for long distance relationships in time, but this put me, gave me a direct feeling for people that were alive. Now, look at this. There's Queen Victoria with Prince Albert in April of 1855. And I shook the hand, I hugged the person who saw this woman in her casket which gives me a, a tangible, um, gives me a tangible expression of life in the past. Now this life, I can stretch it. So here we are in 1855, I can stretch it to this moment, the feeling that these people were real. Oh. So. This moment in 1838, when the uh, teenage uh, Princess Victoria was coronated by men and women that were born in the 18th century, those people almost, I almost can feel them by having touched the one person and she's my link to the next. And it's very important that I, I keep this feeling warm, if you like. And one of the ways I do it, this feeling, by the way, is best described like this, that we all have a past. We all have something we connect to, but never beyond the day of today. Now, this is for me today. I have no idea what will happen tomorrow on Monday. I think we're all reading the news and wondering what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, the same goes for somebody who lived, let's say, in the year 200. They have no tomorrow yet. So the whole idea of looking at these people in retrospect and then reconstructing it, to my idea, is wrong. And one of the ways that I harbor this feeling is that a few years ago, I picked up a hobby that I'd wanted for about 30 years, but I picked it up for serious, in all seriousness now. I've started collecting um, Victorian photographs. Now, I believe, it's a bit of a risky bit of my lecture, it, this, but I thought that if I show you them, I wouldn't have to explain to you what is so special about these people of the past. What you're going to see, actually, I'll start the first one off. What you're going to see is real people 200 years ago, 150 years ago, 200 years ago, real people. Take note, try to read, even if I go too fast, the, the uh, captions on the side because of some of these people. The other thing that I do is I research who these people were, the details of their life. And sometimes it gets very detailed. I'll show you one in a minute. I own that woman's diary, so I know everything about her. Well, that's the point. I know everything about her, but there's always more to know. Now, that goes for these people. In fact, I'll just, I'll just run the gallery. You enjoy it. I do. Change your head, by the way, because she's got a face full of freckles. But do do keep us lead us to it because we're really enjoying um, your narrative along with. Okay, well, this it helps. It really helps having you in front of me. Um, well, there's not much. These are daguerreotypes. For who's interested in early photography, the, uh, these uh, first two were daguerreotypes, uh, uh, perfectly made in uh, uh, in America in the 1840s, 50s, and slight bit into the 1860s. But this is my prize piece. Now, I've got a trick up my sleeve here because I've written a very short biography of her as if that was all I knew. If I were to tell you what I knew, I wouldn't stop today.
this woman who I, well, she was dead um, 75 years before I was born, but still I'm in love with her. Um, the detail I know about this one woman's life, this one past woman's life is exemplary for what would, what kind of lives we all lead, what kind of lives we lead in the 2020s, what kind of lives people left, led in the 1920s, and what lives people led in the 20s, the, Rome, the, the era of Emperor August in Europe. I'm going to have, if you want, I'll put this one on later, but I'm going to click on, because it just goes on and on and on. This is the woman I have the diary of. Um, and she had such a prolific career. I mean, if you read my thing, I have a letter from her husband and he mentions her nickname for her breasts. So this is a, so it's a it's joke. It's like a joke. It's the one joke I know of this woman who lived to be 92 years old. Aren't they beautiful? Or harrowing. I'd love to know is what the story is between, uh, behind this unidentified man. But it's very obvious from both his fingernails and his face that he didn't live long past this photograph. So you're looking at somebody who was perhaps born in the 1810s or 20s and died a century, maybe one and a half century before any of you were born. But a real person, he had a real ego driven reason to have this photograph taken. Somebody suggested to me, what if this was his keepsake for his lover, for his lover, his fiance, or whatever, because he knew he was leaving this earth. All these stories, you can only, you can read them almost in people's eyes. I don't know what the stories are in most cases, but you can read them. So this is the last of the, um, the old photographs. Now, the reason I showed you this series of photographs, I think will be clear from this next one. Now we've just made a jump from two centuries ago to 24 centuries ago. This young boy whose body was found were very well preserved in a bog in Northern Germany. The haircut on my painting is actually the haircut they still found on the on the skull. Somebody measured it and it came to this haircut. He was um, he had been wearing something of wool, some kind of skirt made of wool underneath his clothing, but he wore a, a, a cow skin, calf skin, um, a, um, a mantle uh, uh, um, um, over his shoulders. But he wasn't found with that over his shoulders. What they had done, they'd stripped him of his clothing use it to bind his arms behind his back. They stabbed him to death and thrown him in the water. Now the water is, excuse me, acidic. And um, uh, th this is what preserves uh, the bodies. So this is a pitch perfect, if you like, reconstruction, archaeological reconstruction drawing of what the boy looked like. What my drawing has to do is suggest that he was a person. And I do that as much as possible in all my drawings. So I'm going to show you a series of portraits of prehistoric people. These are all reconstructions of clothing items. But you can see that I could have put any kind of face under this, what is um, most presumably uh, um, uh, a basket woven um, um, helmet. So like a kind, almost like a kind of primitive helmet. It had a hole on top, which they believe might have held a plume. It was found in a, a lakeside village uh, in uh, Northern Italy. Um, I think the date is about 1800 BCE. Um, what my illustrations sought to express, because there are other people have made reconstruction drawings of this helmet, but they're all just, sorry to say, men with a beard, with a beard and maybe something of a tunic. 
mine is forced to express what the object is, namely a warrior's helmet. And this one, I didn't make much up about this. This one was found almost perfectly uh, preserved just a few years ago in southern France. There's another helmet which is almost wilder, um, but it was found in a, in a, in a pit near a, a sanctuary of the Gauls, so the um, pre-Roman French people, um, uh, made of bronze, uh, hammered bronze, uh, shaped like a swan, isn't it? Incredible. Um, um, but it was found next to nine war trumpets, so the big, what they call a carnix, big trumpet shaped like dragon heads. Um, so, again, these, these things are not found with a little label attached telling you exactly what it is. What um, uh, the suspicion, therefore, is, is that either these were people that maybe were blowing the trumpets while, they were go while the troops were going into war, or maybe the trumpets were only used in the temple complex and it had some kind of ritual significance. I mean, it's not a helmet that you can defend yourself with. Somebody will just chop your head in two if they, uh, if they try it on this thin helmet. But what an impressive sight. I mean, um, something about the illustration has to express literally that, the expression of the object which is not always easy to do because I get very little to work with sometimes. So, but I get to work on an awful lot of things. So I've made this caption, one plus two plus three. You know, I just had the three chapters, one plus uh, one and two and three, makes for a million things we or I can do. Now, a few years ago, uh, I started working for a museum in Germany with a curator there called Babette Ludovici, who has uh, become a very good friend of mine. Um, and she uh, and I would have wonderfully animated discussions about nine portraits that I was to make for an exhibition. But they all had to represent a certain point in history. So they all sort of followed up, up, up one upon each other. But the objects I would actually get to work with would be sometimes no more than a piece of metal this big. But then I would be told, oh, well, the metal is special law. So it meant blah, 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 blah. Anyway, one of them that I had to do was of a Germanic warrior. So somebody of the first few centuries AD in Northwestern Europe, uh, who was buried, in this case, his remains were cremated. He was cremated and his remains were buried. Those cremated rest, uh, the ashes, sorry, were buried together with some of his um, richer uh, uh, possessions. And first thing, of course, I, well, I don't so much do, but one thing that I, I, uh, you, you, you cannot avoid is see what other people have made of Germanic warriors. And this is more or less the, the, uh, the norm. Uh, they're all blonde, they're all aggressive because you know, they're buried with weapons. So it must mean they, they took them to the toilet. Um, they all um, have a very a lot of contrast in their claws to express this uh, expression. So you'll say a lot of these people are wearing green and red. But the actual stuff I had to work with was this: a silver belt buckle, uh, uh, two iron mantle clasps that would have either held claws, uh, maybe then a neckline uh, shut or a mantle. And I had the silver tips of what was probably a drinking horn or oh, and um, uh, um, uh, spurs, silver horse riding spurs, which I didn't ch uh, choose to use in my illustration. Um, what we came to talk about, Babette Ludovici and I, was how the person who was buried here had acquired his wealth. And the most plausible, I mean, actually it's written down by uh, a classical author. The most plausible explanation is that he uh, was positioned in a political middle between his further tribesmen and the Romans to the South. So he would have bartered with the Romans. He would have maybe 
handed them trucks, lent them some trucks every so often. Um, he would have told them not, he would not, he would, would have promised them not to attack in exchange for silver, for instance. So the man I was to portray was a power broker. Not a bully, not, a, not well, maybe he was an aggressive person, but not, he was more a political person. And then we came to the talk about the subject of wealth. How did these people become powerful within their societies? Is it because they beat all the smaller ones down? Probably some of that. But one of the things that archaeologists are finding out a lot of um, uh, for, about prehistoric cultures in Europe, that it all came down to how many cattle you had. So I took a picture like this as my inspiration. The more heads of cattle you have, the richer you are. And my illustration became this. So what we get is not an aggressive blonde warrior. In fact, well, this one used to be blonde, but if you can see, he's, he's got his um, Swabian knot, as they call it, the uh, Germanic hairstyle, popular Germanic hairstyle, in a coma over. He's actually balding. Um, he does have uh, um, uh, an entourage of men. Uh, one of them actually has, they see a young boy with a bucket of wine. So they're about, they're, they're about to uh, drink wine. But what they're doing is they're making a business deal. And the business deal can be, in this case, about trading cows. My stud for your stud. That's where power came from in prehistoric Europe. I got to do uh, the portrait of what we called his granddaughter. So this is a Germanic woman who was buried with, cremated, sorry, with exquisite jewelry. Jewelry that was most likely made at the royal court in Rome itself. But it was antique. It was several generations old by the time it went into her grave with her. So the concept we came up with, we called her the footballer's wife, is a woman who um, boasts of her wealth, but it's not earned. It's actually, she's of the most important family and therefore seen as special, but it's not likely she did anything herself to actually attain these, these things. So there's some, um, I was gonna say, sarc is it sarcasm or irony? One of the two in this image. We laughed a lot while we were making them. Now, like I said, some of the archeology, span some of the wonderful commissions I get are based on very flimsy archeology, span like, the most wonderful archaeological find done in the Netherlands in the last few years is the fish trap of Almira. Now, this is the excavation plan, and it's wonderful. It's 600 meters of stakes, which were found in what was formerly a river, uh, in a zigzag pattern. So, um, what it would have done is it would have caught fish swimming one direction, caught fish the other direct, uh, uh, in the other direction. It's a wonderful thing. 600 meters is um, 1,800 feet of, uh, of um, wood. But what do the archaeologists find? This much of the wood, just in the silt. And there's no tops, there's no people, there's no objects, it's just pieces of wood. Now, my first task in this case was to um, try to maneuver my mind around this object. So I raised it above the water and then I made these sketches, small sketches, to see what would be the best way to understand it. My commission was only for one painting, eh? so I didn't get to make three that I can actually turn around it. So um, I, I was looking for different ways of uh, experiencing this object. In the end, this was my final sketch. And beyond that, this became the painting. This is a good and full reconstruction of all the things that you would suppose would have been around one of those fish traps. 
And I hadn't realized the kind of second life that an image like this could have. But recently I was asked to particip participate in a, in a university, um, um, they were applying for a grant. Um, uh, and it's about material culture. Uh, about trying to find out what prehistoric people in this era, which is, in this case, it's uh, late Neolithic. Um, so that's about, I think, did I just, uh, it's about two and a half thousand BCE, I think. Um, what, um, that's about the time of Stonehenge, by the way, for, uh, for to explain further. Uh, uh, this picture was used in that application because it showed that even if you have very little material, you can extrapolate what people would have needed. I mean, I looked at historic fish traps and one of the things that I saw, so they have this, um, oh, I don't know what the English word is, but this this basket, which sort of is shaped like a bell and it catches the fish. I forget what the English word is. Um, but if that's underwater, you need to be able to lift it. And what they will do in historic ones, they will have a rope, which will go over this horizontal bar so you can actually pull it up. It's the simplest solution. So very likely you can actually see it in the bottom archeology span uh, for this Neolithic one as well. They had these low canoes and I say low because they're, they're made out of a tree trunk, but I've seen them on the water and they really go down. It's almost like they're sinking. They're just like a, a little piece of dry wood on the water. So I had to uh, express all that in the painting. And then they had animals that we don't have in the Netherlands anymore. Like the fish that was being caught, that was most prevalent, they did find the bones, um, is one that is, I don't think you find it that very much in Holland anymore. And the birds, certainly not. I mean, there's a few, sorry, but they had them in great numbers in prehistoric times. And also the landscape, the landscape, we don't have rivers as broad as this um, in the Netherlands now, because they're all diked in, but because they weren't then, they flawed freely. So this landscape alone is something that people who are not familiar with the prehistory of this country would not know about. So it, it serves a lot of different functions. Where am I in my talk? Went into the close-ups. Now, the same, the same archaeologist who commissioned me for this Willem Jan Hoogstein gave me a commission. And he said, but all we have is this. What they had done, they drilled into the ground and a place where they knew people had, could have been living in prehistory and they turned up a piece of red orca. Now, this is not natural. So it's man brought to that spot. It's still under the ground. They haven't excavated it. They don't know what it is. It could be anything, but this, the, um, the option they came with for me to illustrate was a burial. Now, again, it's a, it's a standard of archeological reconstruction art. And what you'll often see is you'll see a burial and there's a lot of people like this around it. And I thought, yeah, but these are not people of now. These people would have experienced grief likely in a different way than we do. I mean, there's people in Papua New Guinea that rub themselves in with ashes. There are, there are cultures known where you eat your grandfather's leg when he's dead, because then he's part of you. This, 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 even this, in this modern world, there are different ways of dealing with the dead. From India to Mexico, there are different ways. And in prehistoric Netherlands, I would assume as well. So the first thing I did, I paused myself to I mean, this is not based on any archaeology. This is just me trying to express a different way of um, prehistoric life. And what I was doing was exaggerating grief, making it um, theatrical, which I then turned into sketches. So then I brought in things that the modern audience would recognize, like the love of a dog for his or her lo uh, lost master. Um, and we know they walked around with dogs that had long legs. They were bred so they could um, run after prey in uh, deep water. Um, so that's what this is. This is based on archaeology, but it's trying to um, recompose it in a way that makes you think. The end result being this. 
Um, the painting's not all I was looking for it to be, because when I told my client what I was going to do, I said, I'm going to make a painting about colour. Um, there's the, um, the white sand that the grave was in. There's the red ochre in the white sand. And on top of that was a layer of rotten forest material that had turned black. So it was black, white and red. That's what I wanted to uh, paint. There's so many details in the painting that uh, that idea is kind of lost. Um, there's also something that the archaeologist brought in. He said they actually burnt down parts of the forest. So the forest itself is an ash heap. But the funny thing is, is this was only one option. So the red ochre could have been used for other things. So the same archaeologist gave me the commission to redo the painting like this. So now it's ochre as a different kind of, uh, for in a different use, body paint. This idea of thinking about what every little thing can mean and what you can um, 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 extrapolate and express, well, again, I've used that word express a lot uh, today, um, what you can try to um, find out that might be new, a new thought. Um, I do that in my own work on a smaller scale. So I have, for instance, this pe uh, Mesolithic prehistoric again. Um, headdress. This headdress was found perfectly intact. I haven't made anything up about it. Uh, the way it was worn was figured out by archaeologists in Germany. They figured out how you would have to wear it for it to uh, to uh, sit um, um, comfortable on the head. And one way is that the back of the uh, antler um, arms or whatever you call them, they're actually hollowed out. So the actual thing is much lighter than it looks. Now we also know that the people that lived in Europe at the time uh, very, 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 very likely, I mean, let's put it at 95% now, had a dark skin and blue eyes. Uh, we have nice examples of bows and arrows and arrowheads from that period that have been found. And you put it all together and you get this kind of image that people find would, would, without my kind of work, find very difficult to imagine. But it makes them think as well. Because um, if you don't think about what the intrinsic worth is of the material you have in front of you, you get to do like that, those cave paintings. You do what actors call third eyeing. So you're looking down at a subject and you're describing it, as I said, in retrospective. Whereas the people that lived then were like us as those people from 200 years ago were like us in a certain sense, but their world was a very different one. And that you have to understand from, if you like, the bottom up. This to me is relatively easy because I only have the one find and I have a few other things that I can use just like this. This, this hat, it's, it was perfectly preserved in, um, in, in its fine spot in Germany, there was a Neolithic house. The house had collapsed during a fire. The fire was exactly dated, so there it is, 3,491 BCE. Um, the, um, uh, the house had collapsed and flattened this object, which was a hat. Now, they've made real three-dimensional reconstructions of it. They've put them on people, they've taken photographs of it. What I'd never yet seen anybody do was express what those pieces of bark were for. So this is only a small part of a larger illustration. In the larger illustration, it is raining because what the bark worked as was a rain repellent. What you're looking at is prehistoric rain clothing, which makes you think if they had prehistoric rain clothing for let's say autumn, did they have prehistoric winter clothing? Did they have prehistoric summer clothing? I can combine all those things into more narrative uh, uh, images, like this one for a museum in Belgium. Um, but like I said, 
I don't always get a lot to work with. I like the commissions where I don't get a lot to work with, I must say. So I'm going to next take you to a Neolithic find spot in the Netherlands again, near The Hague, which looks like this. Go ahead, Calvin, start. This is what the spot looks like. And what they found was this. Post holes of a house. Um, the houses in those days, by the way, they were half farm, half uh, living quarters. Um, but inside the house had been a cremation site, a place which had been used for many times over. The question the archaeologist had was, was the house still visible when they burned the first body there? Are they, are they, is there a correlation between the two? Now, I said to the archaeologist, they had several theories. Well, they had four theories, but the two most important were the house was visible. The remains of the house were visible when the first body was burned there, or it is coincidence. Those are the two main theories. The archaeologist gave me the great compliment afterwards of saying you're a co-author of our article because my illustration came up with another option that they hadn't thought of. And this was the first version. What it is, is that the actual cremation was actually centered in between the four post holes of the central structure of the home. So I suggested if you had some of that still standing, the body was more or less cremated in the heart, the literal heart of the home, the half and the heart. So this was my first sketch. We then discussed a lot about how much is actually standing once one of those places is actually torn down. So uh, for instance, I have a lot of wattle and daub walling still up here, but they only found a little piece like that. So that kind of had to disappear. Um, the illustration I'm gonna show hasn't been published yet. So you're actually the first to see it. This is what I made out of it. Out of, if I just go back to, out of this. The narrative, like I said, the archaeologist said it was a new narrative, is that it was intentional to have some part of the house standing so it's as if, it's almost like you're burning the master of the house. This, 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 that is one of the options that that correlation was real and true. How real and true, of course, will never be known. Let's put it there uh, uh, bluntly. Well, in the years I've done a lot of these um, um, sort of um, um, trying to um, bring personalities back to prehistoric people. This is one I did a long time ago. I did this one when um, in the month that my, uh, uh, my um, oldest son was about to be born and he's 22 now, so it's an old one. But this was the story behind this is that they found the skeleton of a teenage boy buried in a tumulus right next to the, uh, the, the floor plan of a house. Um, which to me expressed, again, some kind of intentions almost. And what they then found in the skeleton is that the boy at age, probably age 15, had swallowed a piece of fish, piece of pike and choked on one of the, the, uh, the, the bones had got stuck in his, his throat and he'd either choked or died very shortly after of an, of an infection. Um, what I try to express in this illustration is the loss, the, 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 the terror of the loss of a child. And because I was into babies then, um, it, it became a, a picture of the boy as a baby. I actually did an earlier version where you see a, a lanky 15 year old boy with a pike meal and it was so literal, it didn't add anything to what the archaeologists already knew. Same as this one, this, um, the oldest skeleton ever found in, well, not now, they found an older one, but um, at the time, I think she's about six and a half thousand, excuse me, BCE, Mesolithic hunter gatherer. Um, they called her Treintje, which in Dutch means little train because they found an extra uh, where they were going to put a real track down. Um, 
what they found in, she was quite old. I think she was about 60 years old probably when she died. And they found marks in her pelvis that she had given birth at some time in her life. So what you could most likely assume is that by then she was a grandmother. Um, so what my drawing sought to express most of all was this idea of family, of this small band of hunter-gatherers. Think about it. They're out in the swamplands, but they have a 60-year-old woman with them who they bury in a very special way when she dies. It's all about love and it's all about community. That I sought to express in this, uh, this image. So this is her, um, one of the younglings, uh, having just hunted a, a swan of which they did find the chewed on bones. And again, I can vary on those ideas in all different kinds of ways. Another example, fabulous commission, very little to go on. Bush Barrow Chieftain. So now I'll leave this two seconds. How far am I into this, by the way? It doesn't matter. We're really enjoying it. Right. So okay. go on. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, the Bush Barrow Chieftains, but one of the richest prehistoric graves in the, uh, the United Kingdom, um, full of golden objects, of which the the, the function in sometimes is mysterious. That's this golden lo lozenge, lo lo lozenge uh, with um, little holes for attachment, but of course there's none of the attachment left. So it's been suggested it was worn on the chest, on a piece of wood, maybe on a, or something else, uh, maybe on a piece of leather. Uh, the belt buckle, that can be explained. That's the thing on the top right. There was also a knife handle, which was had tiny little golden pins in, so it would have sh shimmered in the light. Um, there was a staff of um, uh, of a of a uh, some kind of scepter, and there was also an axe. Well, I was asked to uh, do him for uh, 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 a new to be refurbished uh, museum in Wiltshire in, uh, in England, the um, uh, Wiltshire Heritage Museum in Devizes. And I came up with this. By the way, there's my third child. That's my daughter at the bottom. When I took her to the museum to show her the painting, and she said, oh, she was very young at the time. She said, that the, she said, Dad, why are we going to the museum? I said, because there's a painting there with you in it. She stamped her feet and she said, I don't want to be famous in a museum. Anyway, she is now because this one was all over the Guardian and uh, on websites and whatever. It was um, uh, quite a popular picture at the time because they had figured out that those, that um, the only people that could have actually put those pins in must have been children. It had something to do with the eyesight. Anyway, uh, my image, there are other images of what the Bush Barrow chieftain might have looked like and he's all oh, warrior. Mine is an old warrior. Mine is a, a man of a cut with a coat. So he has a princess, my daughter, um, and he has uh, he has a consigliere, like uh, like the mafia, somebody who um, who talks to you uh, and with who you discuss your scheming. And he is of the period that I thought, what shall I do with those heavy objects? And I had them flay, I had him flay them out like he were a pharaoh. He is of the time of the pharaohs. I also personally. I think this is the best thing about the illustration, is that I figured out a way of hanging the lozenge. I looked at uh, Native Americans who have sometimes pectorals on the, had pectorals on their chest, and the way they hung it up fitted that thing exactly. Of course, there is no proof, but it works. I could actually get it to hang using those holes on somebody's chest. And the small things in the illustration that, um, yeah, go close. Oh no, sorry, this is it in the museum with the real stuff in front. And this is him in close up. There's all these small things that talk of his personal history. It's an imagined personal history, but you cannot imagine that he did not have a personal history. I also notice now, I totally forgot, I had his arms tattooed. Then, well, and not before this, 
I was asked by Archaeology Magazine in America to make a spread about Stonehenge. Stonehenge, great, wonderful. This is Stonehenge, it's stones. The commission, I can't even remember what the commission was, what, what the brief was, but it was to show a building phase of Stonehenge, which they did in, but quite slowly, they did it over several centuries. Um, had to be community work, eh? you have to, you need a group of people to help you do it. Um, it has to be therefore planned, so you can imagine who was the planner. Um, but what I was told by the archaeologist that I was working with, Mike Pitts, uh, who actually excavated the uh, Stonehenge, um, what he told me is that he did not know of any reconstruction drawings that actually showed the tools. Whereas they had a good idea if, they, if you bring the stones in on sleds, how big the wood had to be of the sleds. And they know that um, people work the stones with these round stones that they would use as hammers, hammer stones. I think they're actually called hammer stones. Um, and that was the thing that he said, nobody's ever depicted that. So part of my brief was to use the sled and the hammer stones to show the construction of Stonehenge. But I've seen a million of those kinds of illustrations and they're all pretty boring because it's just people in bearskin rugs um, and big beards making, uh, uh, erecting Stonehenge. So what I did instead was a trick. I got you to look at some poor little children first, covering from the rain. So in the middle of the picture, you look at them, then you go behind them and there's a woman bringing around lunch. She's actually bringing around flatbread. Now she's dropped some, because you can see there on the left, she's dropped some uh, of the flatbread. And somebody else is complaining about it. Look, you can see the ha hands sticking out. Then you call past those men and they're, uh, they're, they're again covering from the rain. You can see the sled, sleds, like I said, a perfect reconstruction of exact dimensions that I was given. And then behind that, there's the men with the stones working. And then your eye tr uh, trolls off to the stone being erected, the boring part, if you don't mind me saying. For me, it fit, it worked within the narrative to have the, um, um, to have this, um, um, I was going to say, to have this set in the rain, but uh, I really liked the caption when it appeared in the in the um, in the magazine because they they described it as a typical British summer rain, which I hadn't realised that what I was also doing was situa situating it in England. If you've ever been to England, I'm sorry, this is um, seventy five percent of the weather. Well. This period in English prehistory is very interesting. Like I said, there are some tantalizingly beautiful finds, but there's no, there's very little grander context. There are no temples, except for Stonehenge, of course. Uh, there are no um, extinct, uh, uh, sorry, um, extant houses, existing houses. You can't, it's not easy to imagine the rest, if you like. So when I was given the commission to, um, reconstruct the finds from the nose of Trotty on the Orkney Islands, which consisted of four coverings for golden coverings, very thin, tin, tin foil thin, um, uh, for big buttons, what they think were big buttons, plus a series of amber, well, triangles and hooks without knowing how they were used. Um, I said, well, can I come to the Orkney Islands? And they said, yeah, do that. So that's what I did. I'd wanted to go there for about 25 years. So I finally got a chance to go. I had a reason to go. I flew to the north of Scotland. So I flew London, London, all the way up to Aberdeen. And you get a tiny, tiny, tiny little plane that flies you to an island. Now, it's beautiful. And it's very well known for its prehistoric monuments, including Scarabray, which are Neolithic houses that were covered by sand a long time ago, but they're completely, they're very well preserved. They have cupboards, they have beds, all made of stone, 
This is the Stone Age. Also, I say that jokingly, but there was very little wood on the island. So the only materials they really had to use were peat, uh, seaweed, which they used, um, a stone, and whalebone, if they found it on the beaches. This is a reconstruction at a local museum of what people uh, live like at the time. What they think people live like, of course, excuse me. The island is full of monuments full of stone circles um it's 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 the mecca of um of uh, archaeology in this part of the world but the place i got to illustrate was this forget the hill forget the lovely grave the tomb in the background <laughs> it's this it's this flat i got to illustrate the period just after uh, all of that the bronze age when they think that the large communities of the Neolithic disappeared, that the power center, which Orkney had been uh, in the late Neolithic, had actually moved south to near Stonehenge to perhaps a different people. And um, um, underneath here are Bronze Age houses. Well, they knew a few things about them, the shape, that they were round, blah, blah, blah. But um, that's it, that's it. So one of the things I did in the local museums, I studied the ethnographic collections uh, of the, in this case, 18th, 17th, 16th century, uh, perhaps. No, sorry, it would be 17th, 18th, 19th. Um, and I looked for the things that were particular or the things that I could recognize in some of the archeology, span like those ladles, those born labels, ladles, you'll find them in Neolithic context as well. Um, the use of material, the, um, if you can see on the right hand photograph, you can see that behind them they have these haystacks, but they weigh them down with rope made of seaweed with stones and their sheep climb them and they graze on the roofs of their houses as well. Uh, a lot of this stuff has a long, 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 long history. You can see a lot of this you can even find back in the Neolithic, which is four to, four to five thousand years ago. But the most important thing that I experienced on the island was when I arrived on the, at the airport, and it's a tiny little airport, this room is almost bigger than the airport. Uh, when we landed, when, when I landed, sorry, um, well, the pilot landed and then I got out. Um, I got into the hall and somebody was playing the violin and somebody else was sharing out cake. And then a man said, hello, are you going to town? Just wait outside near my car and I'll take you with me. Uh -huh. And then I noticed while we were driving into town, it's very nice and it's very friendly. So that, there's a stranger, I'll take him to my, take him to the place where he's staying. I saw that he was greeting everybody. And I said, do you know all these people? He said, yeah, it's an island. We all know each other. Now that, that idea of island community, that I thought I had to um, give a voice to in my illustration. That seemed to be typical of the Orkneys as well. The idea that you're locked in for half the year because you can't cross the seas and everybody knows each other. So when I started to sketch, well, first of all, I started by making a clay model of um, these houses to try to get a, of this relatively, uh, how do you say, a meager uh, archaeology, try to get the nicest angle upon it, from it. My first sketches were all about the person who wore the Nauza Trotty golden buttons in the context of other people, revered, um, praised, followed, something which meant that that person was part of a community. And the illustration I'm going to show you is the last in the illustration I'm going to show you, but I have a nice surprise at the end. There are reference to um, early modern um, uh, folklore in this image. The idea that when the oh, I forget. so it's when the sun is at its lowest or highest, um, I forget. 
um, or just before the winter sets in, what's that called? Is that the equinox? Um, that young men would walk around with uh, brandishing fire to, in a way, praise the sun as it was going out. I noticed, well, I noticed, I formalized, put it that way, that um, those golden uh, buttons would have reflected light as well. So I have, I have lots of play with light in, in, in the woman's um, visage. Uh, you can see the, 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 the buttons are actually reflecting in her um, eyes. I also wondered what the hole in the middle was. And I thought, well, that could have been a fastening. If you have this sort of double knot that you pull out, it almost looks like breasts with nipples. Um, so I played with all those things, suggested that the, 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 um, um, that the buttons were playing along. Not, not only did they look like suns, they were playing along with the light of the sun. Now, something really nice happened after that. And it's that it was always the intention, but there were three illustrators working on this project. We each had a different uh, uh, subject. And then Michael Rosen, the famous English author and former Charles Laureate poet, um, uh, would write poems to go with our work. Now, the man can write good poems, so he doesn't need our work to write a good poem. But when I heard his poem, not a, well, the, to which my, my illustration accompanied his poem, I saw that he had actually worked the other way around and he had listened very well. Oh, he had, sorry, he had looked very well at those small details in the illustration. Because I was the first to come up with this idea of this narrative of um, uh, the sun being uh, an element in those uh, things. Sorry, I see that very, um, um, that's very one dimensional, but this, this is very far from the brief that I was given, put it there, put it that way. Um, and Michael Rosen, paid very good attention to this. And I was very proud of what happened. And what happened was, is that he uh, wrote this poem and I have it on film. And it's three minutes, that's all. Michael Rosen first explaining um, the, uh, uh, the archeology span itself, and then it stops and then he tells his beautiful poem. And if you see this illustration, listen to it. They're like, how do you say it? Two hands on one belly. Bronze Age, the Nows are trotty. In the early Bronze Age, individual burials became more common. Some people buried their dead, whilst others cremated them on impressive funeral pyres, as we still do today. In the past, this would have been a spectacular and memorable send-off, and just like us, they would have gathered up the ashes and burned bones of the dead to bury in a special place, often in a pot or box. This burial comes from the islands of Orkney off the north coast of Scotland, and everything was placed in a stone-lined grave that archaeologists call a cyst. We don't know if this was the burial of a woman, but it is likely. By the side of the cremation was a wonderful amber necklace made of many decorated beads and four round discs made of gold. These were thin and fragile and decorated with circles, triangles and rays, perhaps to look like the shining sun. In Orkney, the summer days are long and the sun barely sets, but in the winter, the days are very short and the darkness overshadows the land. Perhaps this woman was seen as someone who could keep the power of sunlight in the golden discs and would be able to bring it back each year. In this poem, we can hear the voice of her family and her community mourning her loss. We have watched the fire die. We have watched the sun die in the sky. We have watched the light die in your eye. But we have a light that lives. 
a light that winks in the water, a light that gathers within gold. And you will wear the light that lasts. You will walk with a light that lives. You will wander through the wilds with a light that lingers. But you will be safe with your sons. You will be helped by their heat and you will be loved by their light. Is that a thank you? <laughs> that was a thank you. I would just want to say I'm I'm personally very moved again by what he just did. I'm very proud that he could not have done that without my visualization about the, the work I did first. But then again, my visualizations would have no point to them if they did not lead to something as beautiful as that. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so very much. And uh, yeah, it's true. And you know, and that's why uh, the whole idea of having you on board to show everyone that how important it, it is, visualization is so important that how interpretation of the artist, of the archaeologist can all, you know, if you work together, it really can do something totally different that you would have never imagined. And yeah. I'm just so moved by your, uh, by your talk. I'm just so moved by it. Well, I, I, well that, that one with the cremation, I really hadn't realized that they hadn't thought of that option themselves. Mm -hmm. But I had the I was speaking to the archaeologist who said, well, I consider you a court author because you've come up with an option that we even haven't, we hadn't thought about when we were looking at the flat plans. Mm -hmm. so, so that's, um, to me, it's almost like, well, of course, it's obvious that this, that this is an option, but not because I'm the only one who's thinking of it in three dimensions and in time, because with that cremation site, one of the important things was, is, so what I've depicted has to be the first burial, because we're assuming that by the second burial, uh, sorry, cremation, um, there was maybe nothing left of the house. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think, you know, I oftentimes feel, and it's so important to have like interdisciplinary work, because as, uh, as an archeologist, and I can say that, that oftentimes we forget the humanistic element that prevails. We are just looking at context and objects and artifacts and the people who were there, you know, we kind of become so scientific in orientation that the emotions, the, uh, you know, things like you were showing the grief and all, and all of it, you know, starts to um, come through. And that's why I myself use an anthropological approach to understand people of the present to make that connect with the past. So when you said that when you meet a person who has met somebody who lived during the century and shook hands, that connect, you are making that connect that way. I make that connect by looking at the descendants of these ancestors. And I'm just like, uh, I just absolutely loved your talk and um, uh, so, so many uh, others, you know, uh, just... Thank you so much, Kelvin, for this perspective. Yeah, I, I went on for one hour and 25 minutes as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we didn't even realize. Well, that um, means we've only got two hours for questioning. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's begin our questions. Um, uh, those of you who have questions, would you please raise your hands? This would be a wonderful time to ask. And while you raise your hands, um, you know, I just want to share that when you uh, you and I were on the roof and you were making notes on uh, uh, my findings on uh, on Karanis, uh, yeah, yeah. the pottery, and you were going into such details and and I was giving them, but little did I know that those little tiny bits of details of how, where the pottery was found or where was, yeah. where do I think it was, how do I think it was, you know, picked up and, you know, even the act of pouring uh, from the amphora. Like, yeah. and when you made that visual, it brought... 
uh, you know, that uh, room in Karanas to life. Well, you're the, per you're the perfect person to have that conversation with because, of course, your research was about how thick an individual makes the rim of an uh, individual part. Mm -hmm. And that you can identify, well, well, that's part of it, and how, how you could identify, am I right? Yes. How you could identify different, if you like, uh, masters and different uh, pupils, yes. which is down to the nitty gritty. My yeah. very first archaeological excavation where I ever went, um, I found a little pot shard and it had these nail imprints in. Well, <laughs> that's all you need. Mm -hmm. <gasps> that's two, that was two and a half thousand years old. Yeah. And I, I always thought to myself, well, I can see the man's um, uh, finger, uh, 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 nail print. And it never realized to me that, it never dawned on me that it was so small that one, it could likely be a woman or two, even a child. Just the fact that I'm it's all soft material for archaeologists, yeah. of course. I mean, you yeah. can't, you can, you can talk about it, but you can't quantify it, if you like. Yeah. And to give a, to give a I small think, example, you know, as an archaeologist, to give a small example, you know, I was in this uh, village in uh, Egypt uh, where um, I found this little uh, stick uh, with uh, 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 the hair of the donkey on the on one end of it, and uh, because I would sit and observe, and I saw it. Uh, there were so many flies around that this person used to use it to brush off the flies while making pottery because it was so it was such a nuisance. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and flies pervade the Egyptian psyche because back in the pharaonic period, you know, even the soldiers were given uh, uh, this brooch of um, flies if they had vanquished the enemies because so the enemies so were taken nice. to be flies. They were so irritating. So how? That's a little yeah. thing like a fly can be so important and the 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 whisk you know to brush off the flies right yeah. and um, a cane which uh, you know uh, in the pottery workshop that i worked in was used to um flog the child which is like uh, horrible but uh, that's the way they teach and if yeah, we were yeah. to find that in context in an archaeological context what would you make of it? And that's where you come in, that you could think of possibilities of representation. I was given a new, I was given a new commission uh, recently, and one of the things I will have to visualize is the how people worked reeds mm -hmm. in the uh, in Neolithic times in Holland. And then the professor was giving me the brief. She said, uh, "It's a rotten job, you know." She said, "Because you have to do it in water, and it's full of flies." Mm -hmm. And I'd never. I'd never, of course, fall to that. I've seen pictures of people cutting reeds, but I never see the flies, you know, sitting on their forehead and them swatting them off all the time. But she said, no, it's a really rotten job because you're right in the fly in the, in the mosquito nests. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. so then I said, well, that's what my illustration will have to be about then. And that's the moot point. Conversations. These little details. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah? Con conversations with people today can give so much of insight. So with that, we'll take our first question. Lucas, what? Lucas has his first question for you, and others, please raise your hands as well. Not so, oh, there, hello. Hello. Yeah, hello. thank you for the great talk. Thank you. Um, actually, uh, I, I don't have directly a question to your work. I yeah, have two on. questions, one organizational. Will the talk be available somewhere online? Because some people missed it, unfortunately, and I would uh, like to show uh, Sonali, it to them. Sonali, yeah, Sonali can answer that. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, Lucas, it. it'll be on our YouTube channel. I have to post last week's lecture also, and I'll put um, Kelvin's lecture as well. And I'll post uh, the link on our WhatsApp and our broadcast link and on the Institute page. So, okay. yeah, and of course, Kelvin will have a link and you can just yeah. message me as well if you wish. And it'll go on my website when I get it finished in the year oh. 2030. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, it's horrible. I just uh, got to uh, from from Kelvin's Facebook. And uh, the other question is this little boy in Germany, which was murdered and thrown yeah. into the box. Yeah. Um, is there any theory why he got killed or any evidence? No, but it was very vicious for you. There's a, there's a very good German Wikipedia page on him, actually, which is very detailed, talks about all the bones research, the whole, whole lot. And they estimate him to be eight years old, but they know that he, he ate an apple the day that he died, things like that, a little wild apple. Um, but the reason he was killed, no, it's lost in the mist of time. 
I mean, why? Yeah, why? Also because why, of. I mean, you can you can imagine why even tie your eight year old boy up. Yeah, and thanks to your drawing, this boy has now become sort of a person. <laughs> you know? And so you right? wonder, like, uh, because of your drawing, yeah, like the boy has now sort of become a person to me. You know, like right. you, okay. Okay. you see the child yeah. which was murdered. It's almost like, like reading in the news from some murdered child or something. Like you see the picture of the of the person, and so now you now you wonder like what happened, like who's the culprit, like. There's a wonderful museum in northern Germany in Oldenburg, which has the the mantle mm -hmm. on display, and they have a great exhibition on um, on uh, on bog finds. I love it. I absolutely love the museum. But I remember when I made the drawing, I thought, well, they don't have anything like this. They don't have anything that makes it that little bit more personal. The best thing yeah. about that drawing, if I may say so, is actually the haircut. That is actually the haircut he would have had, which looks no different from a 10-year-old now. 10-year-old with a bad haircut, but whatever. It's, uh, it's, it's, there's, there's nothing peculiar about it. It's just a, a modern boy in old-fashioned clothing and lived apparently in a horrible time. Yeah, or, or he was the one who had bad luck. He was the one that had bad luck. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you. I'm actually from Germany, so I, I might look it up the museum. Where in Germany, if you don't mind me asking? Sorry? Where in Germany? I'm from Duisburg. I'm from Duisburg. Uh where's that? Oh that's uh that's a uh, that's uh yeah, I know I know where that is, but it yeah. Well it would be a few hours drive to Oldenburg, I think. Yeah, yeah, but I may come along on some trip to somewhere else or something. So okay. there okay. will be a time. Are okay. you an archaeologist as well, Lucas? No, no, no. I'm just interested, uh, interested okay. layman. I'm a teacher, actually. Oh, wonderful. And, yeah. and of course, this forum is for <laughs> academics and non-academics. So we are very, very happy that uh, you joined us today. And whenever it is that you're interested, please keep joining. I have to stress, yeah, by the way, you. I'm not an archaeologist neither. I mean, um, if I would turn this camera around, you'd see an awful lot of books behind here. So I have, a, I have more books than a normal archaeologist, but I'm not trained as an archaeologist. And one of the reasons I think I'm happy I'm not, if I could say so, is that, and I don't mean this insulting because they're wonderful people, but archaeologists do concentrate on, you know, the middle, the middle kingdom, and then <laughs> and another one does the late kingdom. It's very, uh, and I have to be interested in shoes as well, if you like. But some archaeologists don't. There's no, I'm sorry, people. Sonali, I didn't mean you. <laughs> okay, okay. So um, we do have some questions which were posted on chat, and I'd call out okay. the names so that they can ask. So Manan, Manan, Doctor Manan, he has a question. So Manan, if you could take on the mic. Uh, yeah, am I audible? Yes. Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hello, Kelvin. That was a, a brilliant presentation and amazing artwork. Thank very, you. very impressive. Uh, my question, I mean, it's a very uh, basic question. Uh, yeah. What medium do you use for these illustrations? Is it water I, colors? I, I, Is it ink? I knew somebody was going to ask the question. Um, it's actually acrylic paint with color pencil, but the last 10 years, maybe I've been doing a lot of digital after work. So there's a lot of, um, uh, the, some of the, I'm not supposed to talk, say this just in case I give away the secret, but, uh, there's a lot of, um, um, digital Photoshop trickery in it. A lot of photographic materials worked into it, which make things look rougher. And, um, but in fact, I mean, if I just turn around here, this is a, this is a small uh, unfinished painting. So you can see it's just paint, oh, just rough paint uh, on a piece of board. Okay. Uh, the reason I, I asked is uh, because I do have a, I am currently learning how to uh, make hyper detailed illustrations for scientific purposes. Yeah, yeah. And oh, for scientific I mean, purposes, okay. Yeah, uh, scientific illustrations, and yeah. I was just curious. And also, I do have uh, 
habit of making these quick sketches during my travels and tricks. So just yeah, wondering yeah. how, what medium was used for your work? Well, I know, yeah. I, I don't see her now, but there was somebody, Kathleen Kalaki, she was uh, listening into this. She's a scientific illustrator. And I think if okay. I, if I can, if I can guess it, what her answer would be, I don't know if she's still here, then she, she could put it in the chat. Um, it would be watercolor and uh, gouache is what a lot of scientific illustrators seem to use. Because watercolor, you can, you know, build it up slowly and and gouache is quite easy and it dries quicker and whatever. Uh, the stuff that I use is terrible to get on your clothes. You can't get it out. So acrylic. Okay. So, thank yeah. You. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And nowadays you get these sketch pens kind of th things, but which are watercolors. So maybe oh, well, Anand, you could. Yeah, okay, actually, yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but of course, the most modern solution for any kind of watercolors is an iPad Pro. I don't have one, but I've seen people do life drawing with it, and they can mimic a watercolor or mimic any kind of paint on this little digital tablet. Well, it's not little, it's big, but and expensive. But, uh, but I think the diary, the journal, I think that really is the beauty of it is yeah, holding that's it. Yeah, physical. Flipping yeah, okay, pages. okay. I agree. I yeah. agree. I agree. Yeah. 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 So uh, let's ask the next question. It's uh, Dr. Shaila Bantanur. Uh, she's an um, uh, architect. So she has questions sure. for you. Thank you, Sonali. Am I audible, Sonali? I can hear yes. you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, nice presentation. Thank you for, you know, uh, Sonali, like organizing the, such a wonderful talk. You know, it's a, uh, though I am from architectural background, but you know, the talk was very interesting to know about so many different, uh, you know, the kind of a people, the, especially my interest, uh, my question here is like, you know, um, Kevin has mentioned uh, something related, uh, some examples related to the Stonehenge, you know, uh, yeah. where he has used the people used to use the blanket uh, stone as the blanket. So can, could you please explain how exactly the their, uh, you know, the utensils and the kind of uh, uh, earthenware or, you know, like uh, how the stone was used extensively during that time? I'm not, I, I didn't quite hear the last bit, but you were asking how the round stone was used. Yeah, the stone it's, as I, a I, blanket. I think, I think, stone as a blanket. Done... Sorry? Stone as a blanket you mentioned, you know. Uh, uh, how was it? No, it's a hammer stone. So it's like, I think they have them in, don't they have, didn't the pyramid builders use them as well? Sonali, would you? Mm -hmm. So it's like a, I think it's about a stone size of a small um, bowling ball. And you just use it to hammer the stone, to work it. So it's not okay. cutting the stone. It's just making it flat. It's by boom, 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 making these little indentions until you've, mm -hmm smoothed it out now yeah they still do sorry. it even in, sorry even in the himalayas like i've witnessed them doing it like you know doing it oh, really? like that and even when they used to make the obelisks they use those hammer stones to kind Have of you see people in the himalayas use hammer stones uh in one on one occasion wow yes. i'd like to see that because like hmm. you know it's a it's a it's an ancient technique it's not as if you can go on google and find people doing it was that oh, your yeah. question? Thank, uh, answered? I'm thank not you. Sure. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I and I do feel that um, uh, with the uh, hammer stone, you know, it would have started that way, but eventually, even in pottery, you see the hammer and the anvil method starting from Africa, and um, even now, hammer and anvil is used in pottery too. So. Okay. Uh, like uh, Vibha is saying, Vibhaji is saying, we have stone hammers with wood. Um, so yeah. What are any questions in the chat? Did you say that? Uh, yeah, we, I asked one question, but I do want to uh, get Parth, who is a prehistoric archaeologist. He's a very dear friend. Parth, if you can hear me, I would love you to come on board and uh, uh, maybe think about how you visualize and how, um, you know, uh, because we, talk, we, we saw a lot of prehistoric representations. So let me see if he's there. He is. Parth, are you around? Yeah, he is online, but I don't know whether he can hear me. Okay. Anyway, does anybody else have questions? 
so i think vibha ji you mentioned something about interpretation of shamanic rituals and that that seems to be yeah. a problem okay can i yeah, yeah so okay let me come that. yeah it was very interesting that you uh, that you showed the um, you know the antler's horn as yeah. as being worn by a hunter and that sort of that's that is how i think it must be done but you 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 must know that in some of the rock paintings it has been uh, interpreted as a shaman or a priest yeah. wearing it and yeah. we as an anthropologist always had that problem that how do you know that it is not for some other purpose so you know just the whole interpretation okay this, of even so the rituals i mean do you actually come across that that people say that okay you have interpreted in your paintings in a certain way but how do you do it i mean you have explained well, it to well, us and i understand it but at the same time when it comes to rituals um the anthropologist always have that kind of you know look at the archaeologist that you know this is something so much in the past that a lot of it is conjecture yeah so well, yeah the, the, the fine spot the fine spots of the um well the fine circumstances of well i'm saying it wrong the um the actual archaeological finds so there's several places along a, a sort of a border that goes from yorkshire in england to northern germany mm -hmm. um uh, with the north sea in the middle but that's all drowned land um there's a there's a there's a uh, there's like a cultural sphere where in these uh, these antler headdresses were um um uh, available now of course, the archaeologists don't know if they were used for ritual or for hunting, but the ones that were found in Star Car, which is not, uh, in Yorkshire, they found about, I think it's 14 or 21 of them, I forget, I think it's 21, um, that were actually cut down even more and then hollowed out. So they're nothing more than little things on top of the head. Now, we're not assuming there were 21 shamans. Yeah, yeah, uh, of course, of course, of course, yeah. Of course, it could be a dance. It could have been the refuge, a, a ref, refuse from a dance or something like that, anything. But there's, um, but they, they seem a bit, they seem a bit commonplace at, uh, at a star car. Yeah. Of course, I don't know if they're very good um, disguise. Mm -hmm. Stuff um, like that. So, I mean, what I drew was one option, but I mean, I'm, I'm I don't even have anything in the illustration that doesn't tell you that this person is participating in a ritual. That's why I don't have a background or anything. If I'd drawn him in the forest trying to shoot a deer while he's hiding behind the bushes with a fake deer uh, 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 headdress, then it would then it would be talking about the hunt. But I just wanted to show what it would look like on a human body in the right scale. Yeah. yeah. But it's true, it's true. Nobody really knows what these things were used for. Since when I was researching, I thought it was remarkable how common they were in this region. Yeah, that's what I was, I was looking at your illustration, the fantastic, it was a fantastic talk, yeah. you know, I was so sort of glued in, but also just the imagination. And it's very interesting that you were imagining something that the archeologists themselves are not, you know, as you said, that you are thinking in three dimensions. Because um, even with the future, sometimes people go to the writers as to how do you see something affecting yeah. and how it will result in a future, yeah. a futuristic landscape. Yeah. So you are going back in the past and you are projecting your way of thinking. And that would be very different from what a non-artist would think. Yeah, I think I think probably a scientist yeah, would have a difficult, a... difficult uh, mm -hmm. time describing how love or grief feels. But you could ask an author. Mm -hmm. could no, ask because an author I mean, yeah, it. yeah. This is what was going on in my mind when I was looking at it. That look, it's a, it is, it requires a creative mind to actually yeah, put I'm, together I'm all these elements. I must stress though that the bottom line of everything that I do is archaeological reconstruction yeah. works. I do reconstruct that which I can reconstruct. But if I have a pair of shoes but I don't have any socks, well, I have to imagine the socks. Yeah. Or at least the feet. Yeah. No, it's, least... it's yeah, it's wonderful the way you because I look I looked up some of your other drawings also. <laughs> okay. And it was very interesting to see that how you recreated the the shops in uh, Leiden or where was it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know how the shoemaker and all kind yeah, of yeah, things. Yeah. And I was thinking of little stories behind. So your pictures actually have stories, isn't yeah. it? So 
Yeah, well, I get paid to give them as much as possible, so yeah. I stuff it full with uh, with yeah. stuff that they can pick out yeah. later. Can I, I, actually, can I, actually, just... I actually sometimes get the uh, the criticism for my work that it looks rather boring because I make it. I try <laughs> to make it look rather mundane, but then. Then I get I hear them about a week later and they say, oh no, we discovered all these things in the background. We hadn't seen them, <laughs> no. which is funny. Sorry, I, can I say? just ask if there's no other question? You, uh, I mean, on your, I think, web page or something, when I was trying to sort of work out, you know, what kind of illustrations you do, because the, the talk had things about light and reflect reflection. But um, that is also one thing that I was going to say that you're talking about, you know, because you're always looking at where the light is coming from. And what is the source of light in your paintings? Well, you see, well, there's a lot of darkness, from, and then there's light it comes from. Well, I, I use the light as an element that I want to talk about. So, for instance, that mm. cremation scene, the light is actually in the right place in the sky for the orientation of things. It was very important that the light came from the right uh, right place, um, and I use light. I actually use the shadow to. Um, mask the things that I don't want to talk about too much. If you know what I mean, there's not. I can't. I can't reconstruct every little element. So sometimes I just mask them in shadow. And but to get a shadow, I need a strong light. Sometimes it goes too far and I make things too dark. I do admit, but you're you're muted. Um, yeah. Um, no, you know. Yeah. <laughs> no. I, I muted myself to hear you oh, <laughs> properly. Yeah. Um, no, that's fantastic. And you, you, uh, uh, you mentioned something about working on textiles. Or yeah, is it? my favorite subject. Yeah. Yeah, it's because you, I think you were there for my talk on the Naga textiles. I was, I was, I was, I was, I was, I was. Yes, yeah, because you yeah, talked yeah. about the outer covering of the body. <laughs> so you, you did. Sorry. No, because I was thinking that no, you 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 uh, you had typed a comment about textiles being the you know the outer skin the outer covering, yeah. and I was looking also you know how you depict the clothing, and yeah. and how all those pins that are found. I I don't know whether did you see that exhibition on the um, uh, these Celtic finds Cel Celtic Celtic how do you Celtic, pronounce Celtic, the Celtic. Celtic yeah. Celtic yeah I saw the exhibition in Edinburgh and it was just amazing because some of the pins that you fine yeah, which yeah. hold together the the clothing you mean, you mean the permanent exhibition or do you mean the no it was i don't know it no it or was, was a not temporary a, one. no it was a temporary one because the permanent exhibition at the national museums of scotland which is in edinburgh is the, yeah no that's the that's where i saw it it's just, it's just one of the best it's yeah that's uh, where i saw it yeah First of all, the whole decoration of the is done with modern artists. So the, the actual yeah. presentation is done is modern, but then the objects are grouped per kind. So you yeah. can find textiles there and you can find goals there. And it's mm -hmm. um it's, it's stunning, that museum. Because yeah. yeah, I was remembering that when you were showing the buckles and the pins. Yeah, that picture of the now's yeah. project find that was actually from the museum. Mm, that's the okay. Okay. I shall yeah. go mute now. <laughs> we have a question from uh, uh, Louise Mumford, and then oh, yeah. we have a question from uh, Shamsher Thakur. Well, I, I see the question by Shamsher Thakur. That one, where's the yeah. one with Louise? Yeah, oh, but Louise, what? Well, Louise, because she's been here since the beginning. Hello, yeah. Louise. Nice yeah. to meet you. Oh, can't hear you. Oh, there you go. Can't hear her, but she's not. She's How's not. That? Is that better? Yeah, that's better. That's better. That's it. I was going to say hello from Wales. Hello. Um, and thank you for a wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it. We, we could have listened for another hour, Ugh. quite honestly. <laughs> um, it was leading on from what was just said, actually. I was going to, it was textiles that I'm, I'm strangely obsessed by. In fact, when I first came across you, I've followed you ever since. That, oh, when I gosh, came, you've got I that saw the, Yeah, I saw the I... exhibition. In, in, oh, really? I had to go over to Ireland. It wasn't shown in England, so I had to go to Ireland to the Irish Linen Museum. That's like somebody exhibition. showing me my sins from the past. Yeah, no, I I I, I no, first saw your work then, um, and um, archaeological textiles are a bit of obsession with mine. And I've always really impressed with the way you depict clothing, and because of your Im immense attention to detail, I was wondering about how you approach it. I mean, you must know a lot about the drape and um, things like that. But also when um... and never, never, never enough, of course, because it's not as if I have a cupboard full of replicas. So I always well, sort of 
but I sorry, wondered Claire. if you, I wondered if you, I mean, because people do reconstruct, I mean, I, I, as well as being a conservator, I also, um, I'm a reenactor and people reconstruct clothing um, and they often say, particularly with sort of medieval and later clothing that, you know, the, the way, well, the, the layers of clothing and how it's constructed alter the way people stand and move yeah, yeah. and walk. I just wonder whether you ever work with people who reconstruct clothing and, and no, re, but you I, know, I, I stage. Do... No, not, not 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 so much. But I do I, I do have these. It's just an anecdotal thing. But there's um when um actors, modern actors for Hollywood films, say when they're asked to put on originally cut 18th century jackets, they say they can't fit them because it pulls your shoulders small. together like this. Because it's very sm small, and it's it's almost like people were wearing clothes in a different way in uh in the 18th century. Like they they held their bodies different to be able yeah, to fit these yeah. clothes. And and people and, people who wear them do often say that that it makes you walk differently and stand yes, differently. It stretches your back, I guess. It's because it pulls you because it's very tight. And I'm very aware of that. So for instance, I've just made a I'm making a painting, I'm finishing it now. It's about uh Roman soldiers, Roman legionaries digging uh um um uh digging a canal. And um They've got this dress, this tunic that is some of them have got that's tied on one shoulder and it leaves the other shoulder bare. But I wanted to know how does that drape? How does that drape? So what I looked at on Google were photographs of uh, laborers in India. Because I I know that I know that that's probably cotton and that these uh, Romans were wearing either linen or or, uh, or wool. So I do uh, take that into account. But what I'm looking at is if there's a special way that they um um it, it, does it look does it look uncomfortable to me all those things i need to uh, put across uh, i mean so um i'm in a first century roman reenactment group so i'll get oh, yeah. some of the guys to i'll find out for you oh yeah please i i, I need some photographs <laughs> although it won't be till next year because obviously we're not no, can't do anything this year but I, i've seen them do that because the tunics are so big, they're huge. Yes. That if they're made to scale, thing. they're very, and they're actually quite long as well. Yeah. Surprisingly that's long. They're so, they're so voluminous, they have so much volume yeah. that they yeah. fall different than you, than you would see in a comic strip, if you know what I mean. A comic strip where they've just got a tunic that ties to, to, yeah. tied to the body. Yeah. yeah, I'm very aware of those things. Totally, always very aware of them. Yeah. I that thought the you past, were. The past was the same, but very, very different. You know, as they say, the past was like a, is like a another country. Yeah. What is it? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know it. Yeah. Do things differently then. Yes, yeah. they do things differently. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. I saw Thank that. You. I saw that question yeah. by. Um, Shamshir Thakur has the next question, I, and then and then Parth messaged me uh, because his connection is bad. So after. Shamshir Thakur, I'll take Pat's question. Okay, because that question by uh, Miss, is it Mr. Ch uh, Thakur? Is very interesting because I do actually. Yes, I've. Spaces. Yeah, he's he's online, so he'll ask you. Yeah. If you if you mind, I'll just walk over to the cupboard there. And also... Hello. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Yes, yes. Um, uh, see, actually, oh, uh, this. Hello. This lecture was very fascinating. In fact, it uh, glued me to the entire series here uh, right now. And I've been glued to this lecture. In fact, what was interesting, I just I was looking very closely at the faces. In fact, so do you actually really research them as the faces would have been at that point of time? Yes, I do. And I'm going to I'm just going to walk off to the books, books there and I'm going to pull a book out and I'll come back to you. Well, it's not not as if this is a surprise, but if you if you look into, let's say, first century, second century, third century Romans, you cannot go amiss by looking at the Fayum portraits. And then what you start noticing is, for instance, you know, you can you can if you look at let's say a Renaissance portrait, they'll never have. Well, no, that's a bad example, but. You know, everybody wants to be portrayed uh, at their best. But what you can see here is you can see where people have forgotten to shave, for instance. You can see 
for instance, one thing that I'll always notice is that when, when they have a beard, it grows right up to their cheeks. Yes. So, you know, if, if you had a beard, if I had a beard, we'd probably, you know, round it down a little bit. We wouldn't have it grow up to our eyebrows. But these people, you know, they're perhaps shaving less or whatever. So one, you, you see it again. But, uh, yeah. but Kelvin, do give a background because maybe many of uh, us here do not know about the Fayum portraits. Well, they're, 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 they're portraits yeah. of people that were buried with their mummies. And um, there are always discussions whether they were painted fantastically after they were after they died, or if they were painted in in life. And I think there was a recent. They did a child's mummy. They reconstructed the face, and it looked the double of the portrait. So what they think is that it was painted by in, in life. Not all of them, perhaps, maybe, but I mean, sometimes people die unexpectedly, of course. But they were all, they were all commissioned. Uh, during their life, so they obviously wanted to look their best. But you're right about them. You know the trend that you know how their beard was. Yeah. So it's just you see everything. You see you see different. You see different shaped eyes. You see different shaped noses. You see a red nose. You see a white pale face. You see you see uh, hair that's been cut well. You see hair that's been less cut well. All those things go into at least my. Um, my sensitivity to painting when it comes to people in let's say the mesolithic hunter gatherers all we can all we know is we have some wall paintings from from uh, mostly from spain and you can see silhouettes in hair and it's almost like they've got their hair tied up and stuff like that but there's no details of course so and not and and and, think of it. and and uh, how did you research about this Stonehenge one about the uh, faces. Oh, there's a little detail that is just a little, it's just a little playful trickery. But the woman, there's a woman holding the bread. I painted her. Lips. Yes. Did you see that? No, I, I couldn't go into the details about lips, but I was very fascinated about because see, Stonehenge has always been a center point of some mystery novels, and so I read it about in some mystery novels, and then there was a series on National Geographic. Yeah. So it always fascinates me about how Stonehenge was there and still there is a mystery surrounding it. So uh, actually I was looking at the faces very closely. The faces that you depicted, the central faces of that woman and yeah. the child which is I think behind her if I remember the picture yeah, clearly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so that's why I was asking how did you picture that? So did you actually uh, try computer uh, uh, graphics for that before painting it or did do you uh, that's my another part of the question do you uh, actually go into computer graphics before making it computer animations or do no. you simply draw it that way I simply draw it <laughs> and no wow. I don't, that's I don't really but um, what's very funny is that that woman with the the guy with the swan uh, yes. Her skeleton was found, and while I was painting it, somebody was making a 3D reconstruction of the skull. And so all I had was the physical anthropologist gave me a description of what the skull looked like. She said she had high cheekbones, she had this kind of chin. So I drew what she described. And then when the 3D reconstruction was made, they looked perfectly the same. Amazing. Amazing. I was very happy with Thank that. Thank you, sir. I was, I was quite impressed by that, that we'd gotten it so right, if you like. So that was based on on um, on that. But the young man doesn't have a beard in my illustration. That I don't know. Did they have beards? I assume that. I, I have no idea. I was recently wondering, because my next one of my next commissions might, I still haven't got the, uh, might be to draw Neanderthalers, Neanderthal people. Wow. And uh, wow. they found a piece of flint. Anyway, I was thinking... Did it, could a Neanderthaler shave himself? So what I was looking for was how Native Americans shaved themselves. And all they used were little pieces of flint. And then they would shave themselves. And then so and you could shave your head. So that's what I'm, my illustration, if I get to make it, will actually be a Neanderthal and his daughter is shaving his head. Wow. Because then what you have is you immediately have this you have a few themes going on. Family, uh, love, care, uh, that's free for, um, uh, social structure, and a, a different use to the flint. I don't think an archaeologist is ever looking at the flints 
thinking, well, you could shave your mustache with it. <laughs> you know, they're not thinking about that. They're thinking about, well, they, they do research, of course, but. And I think um, it is imperative that they do that because of lies, you see? They have to get That's rid another, of the lies. Well, that was yeah. my first illustration, was actually having his daughter pick out his lice. But then I thought, that's too primitive looking. So I'll make it that he, she's actually shaving his head. And he has a mohawk or something like that. And another good question that will always remain is, did Neanderthals actually use sharp uh, tools? Well, <laughs> Oh yeah, the piece of tool that I have to the piece of tool that I have to reconstruct is a piece of flint like this, and it's got birch bark, a birch. Um, oh, I don't know what the English word is. Tar, like tar, like a little handle. So it's a little object this big, but it's a handle and a flint. Now you could use that for a lot of things, but I thought, wouldn't it be nice if you were just shaving your sideburns as a Neanderthal man? True, true, very true. Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And I also want to add, you know, uh, Kelvin, after going through the Fayum portraits in the Cairo Museum, and when I went to the site in Fayum, okay. <laughs> I don't know whether it was the Fayum portraits being played on me, but every individual that I saw at the site who lived in the village looked to me to be a descendant of the Fayum portraits. Yeah, they, 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 were, faces and yeah they were so yeah. similar. I'm sure you must have felt the same. There's a there's a wonderful there's a wonderful uh, mosaic from I think Tunisia or Algeria probably Algeria, and it's of a Roman man and he looks like he's dark blonde and he looks like Don Johnson in Miami Vice. He has that kind of you know, cut like that. The the cut of his hair is so anachronistic. It's not because it's two thousand years old, but to us it's not what you would imagine. So there what what I'm looking for variety is variety as well. Um, so the idea that one has his beard this long and the other one has his beard this long and the other one. If you saw those two Germanic chieftains, both of them were old, older, and one was graying and the other one was balding. So it's variety in, in human types, if you like. And I like I the fact, uh, you know, the unheard voices when you even talk about it in archaeology, the disenfranchised, you know, who do not have a voice. You're giving them an image through expression, through their true nature. And I find that so fascinating, you know, the you, expression you have, of it. Well, yeah, but I have to expect, my work is of course meant for a greater public. So I'm not make not all of it making it for me. I'm making it so other people can, you know, experience something new with the archeology. span Yeah. Uh, so um, often I get responses, which I never even thought were in the picture, but it's nice that people are thinking. That's what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to unnerve you. That's one thing not give you what you already know, but give you some a little bit of something you don't know. And always give them, because you know that's good teaching, always give them a little bit of what they do know mm -hmm. and then expand. So for example, in your own studio, the interplay of light from your- I know, I'm looking at it, it's uh, irritating. <laughs> <Yeah>. tells, <laughs> us, tells us that when light falls on your paintings, that's maybe that's the time when you think of death. I don't know, <laughs> I just, <laughs> okay. So, um, Parth has asked me, Parth is a prehistoric archaeologist and um, I oftentimes make fun of him. I said, you're prehistoric and I'm historic. Can I do the same? Uh-huh. I'm joking. Yeah, yeah. So during the uh, lockdown, he was uh, stuck, uh, pleasantly stuck in the Himalayas with me and he had this beard. I was like, no, you're truly a prehistoric archaeologist. But mm -hmm. anyway, jokes apart, he, uh, his uh, connection is going off and on. So he's messaged me to ask uh, two questions. The first one is, what is the average size of your paintings and the average duration of the entire process? That's Ooh. the first question. Um, and then I'll ask the duration. next one. Well, <laughs> it's a good question. I, I have the same answer to the one painting, but I just you just have to excuse me. I'll just get it. It's there. So I wonder if I can get it. Get. So this is not the average size. This is about twice as big as I would normally paint, probably. But this was supposed to be a really big wall. It's 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 the harbor of medieval Bruges. Well, I'll see if I can turn it. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. 
Well, at the time I was working with an assistant and when, when I was done with this and it, I asked them, how long did I actually spend painting that? If you counted all my hours together. And he said, I think you could do that in two weeks. And of course I laughed because I was probably six weeks on because the phone rings, I have to go to the dentist. You get distracted by so many things. And it's, so I work really, it comes across like I work really slow, but I actually work very fast when I'm working. Do you understand what I mean? It's just, it's just, it's just so unstructured. Alas, it's so, uh, um, 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 it's very difficult in Dutch to have an expression. You can't always keep the, uh, the, uh, the arrow taut. You can't always keep the bow strong, if you know what I mean. At one point, you just have to let go of the pressure. So there's a lot of pressure for me to do these things because I always start with a white canvas. There's nothing there. And for the first three weeks, I think I'm going to die making it because it looks horrible. And then, and then the only time I really like the painting process is about the last two hours. <laughs> <laughs> and also like... Um, so yeah so you can't always stay happy it's easy to get distracted put it that way and also like even when like i feel that when we do work or so uh, thoughts pervade our mind we, we plan in our minds that so much of work itself maybe we are not actually implementing it but you know just thinking about it takes so much of oh, us you're totally, i yeah. mean you could probably write a book in two weeks but if i told you to start tomorrow morning at nine could you get it finished in two weeks time not at all. I'll be like, oh, exactly. I'll be thinking for of, of it about for two, three months before exactly. I actually start. I have, I have the same thing. Yeah. I mean, the really nice part of my work, and I must say all my colleagues that I've spoken to about it, they love this bit as well, is the research. Yeah. And the research, the, research the devil lies great. in the details, you know, as they say. Yeah. And you can't go too far with the details. But anyway, uh, but it, no, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, I collect this much material and this is how much you see on the picture, but at least it's there. Yeah, exactly. And nobody can um, understand what all you have gone through to get here, you know, what you have, you know, read, but have not included, or you mm -hmm. have read, but which is included, or things yeah. that you have imagined, you know, and yeah. how you have imagined. Yeah. So this, if, this I, if I don't make my deadline, I always think, well, they just don't understand that what they're missing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the second question that Parth has is, as an artist, okay, you're trying to guess the prehistoric artist's mind. So why would some themes be common over others in rock art? Common animals oh, and objects, it, as common animals and objects on landscape are often not painted. So he's trying to uh, understand how you get into the mind of the prehistoric uh, uh, person. Uh, oh, I'm not sure I'm trying to get into the mind of the prehistoric person mm -hmm. to start with. I'm trying to make their mind believable, but I don't assume that I could get into their mind. I mean, I, I told you about, I showed you the photograph of that woman. I said, her, I have her diary. Mm -hmm. And the, even having her diary, having a day-to-day -day description of her life, there's things I don't understand. Like for instance, she didn't seem that very concerned about her children until I read a second book, which is about Victorian upbringings. And mm -hmm. it said that Victorian people of that era mm -hmm. said that children should be treated with a kind of distance because that would make them stronger. Mm -hmm. At one point, she talk, she she calls her children a name, and it's like a really nasty name. And I know she loved them because she was her children became famous and they always refer to her. But um, and it's the Victorian way. Well, I just don't understand it. I just don't get it. So how am I going to get into a hunter gatherer's mind? I don't get it, but I can put them in a position that makes them believable. I mean, there's things that I. I can't, uh, I could avoid doing like, um, um, see, I always have to make sure when I make somebody laugh in a drawing that I'm, that I'm realized that I'm suggesting that, that they know jokes. Mm -hmm. And, but the same, at the same time, if I make them too serious, they just become like, warriors all the time all of series and trying to survive prehistoric times and that's not my intention either i um yeah what's the answer then to that now i don't try to get into people's mind because i don't think i can but i do try to portray it in a way that um you imagine see 
Okay, one example, the boy that was murdered, he has a very sad face in my drawing. Mm -hmm. So you look at him, you think, oh, well, he knows he's going to be murdered. That's nonsense, because maybe he had a very happy day playing with his friends uh, all morning. You did, that's, that's, that, he's just an eight-year-old boy. But I portrayed him with a way of suggesting what was about to happen to him, which is a dirty, sentimental trick as an artist to play. Because mm -hmm. I'm seducing you to think what I'm trying to get you to think about the drawing. But it's nonsense. And but also like because humans are so wild uh, uh yeah. similarly in terms of emotions and you know we we experience happiness and grief and things like that so that's yeah. a common line that goes through the landscapes may change times periods may change your the objects that you engage with may, with, with may change but these uh, uh these basic instincts stay the same isn't it they had a, they found, they excavated a, a bathhouse, which they think might have been a brothel, actually. Uh, that was the one theory in England of the Roman period. And in the sewers, they found all these baby skeletons. Oh, dear. And what they think was that the unwanted babies were literally being flushed down the, the toilet, if you, if you like. And it's a horrible story, but it does tell you that the way we feel, I mean, you just said, oh, my dear, but a Roman would have said, yeah, what are you talking about? It's a baby. Yeah. Maybe, they did, maybe I don't, I'm not sure about this. I don't want to get into the theory because it's not my field. But um, it, there is a suspicion that they thought different about people until a certain age, perhaps. But even today, female infanticide kids are, you know, just killed. And you wonder... You, oh, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't say yeah. this in Britain. You couldn't say this in Britain 2020. Everyone, everybody would be going like this. Yeah. But in, in 120, they probably went, yeah, whatever. Okay. Okay. Well, they wouldn't mm -hmm. have said whatever, but. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anyway, I hope somebody shuddered to think about it. Anyways, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we have a question from uh, Vadanya. She's a budding artist and she was kind of oh, yes. shy asking mm -hmm. a question. She, she yeah. really draws very well. And I really want her to come online and ask questions. So Vadanya, it's the time to shed your inhibitions. Yes. Hello. Good evening. I I don't think you can see my fish on the camera, but I I can't see you and I hear you very badly, but it's okay. I'll try. I, I'm having some network issues. Uh so I'm actually pursuing fashion at uh NIFT in New Delhi. Mm -hmm. And uh I really like your uh, your presentation. Hello, I think you can see me now. Hello, hello. Yes. So um I did have a very similar question regarding the boy, but I think somebody already asked. So I was very uh, interested to know about the actual story behind it. And I wanted to know how you brought that into your painting. So. Uh, well, what I just said is that uh, I painted him with a sad face because I know how the history ends. But mostly I was interested in reconstructing the haircut. I mean, the mantle is interesting, but there are more examples. But some one, some obscure German archaeologist uh, actually measured all the haircuts on this on the uh, on the on the, um, on bog bodies. So they have these well-preserved bodies that are sort of they look like leather, but some of them still have their hair and measured their beards. And it was wonderful because you got a whole gallery of prehistoric um, um, hairstyles, men with goatees or with their hair shaved. Uh, it's not, it's not those wild, uh, it's not those wild animals, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I I also wanted to ask why you had uh, why you uh, you know you've shed so much of light on especially the hair card. I understand. It's a way of telling a story. Um, it's a way of telling a story. You can express something about somebody's personality. I once did um, uh, a, a, an illustration for an exhibition, and it was about Vikings attacking a city. This has all, all happened because in the archaeology, they had found the dead bodies of people uh, in the ground, actually, still where they had been slain. But they think that the Vikings destroyed the church. But that would have also been the last place where the people of the town would have hidden. And so what I drew was a guy trying to um, more or less watching as the, the Vikings approach. And he's, he's a guard, so he has a spear. But I gave him a very bad haircut and I gave him like an under chin. And he looks like a man who is too old for the job and he's not going to stop them. But you can actually see it in the portrait. 
And I know this because uh, some very famous artists gave me a compliment about that one figure. They said, oh, that was so smart what you did with the hair. Because this hair was just, they think, oh, terrible haircut. Therefore, he looks like a weaker person, if you know what I mean. Um, I got my hair cut two days ago, so I didn't look like a, a slob on this uh, video. Because <laughs> um, it, it works that way. You can you 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 automatically interpret somebody from how, uh, uh, what they look like. I mean, your hair in the two colors makes you look young. Even if you were 18 <laughs> years old, your hair would make you, you know, you know what I mean? Yes, I understand. I because can tell we something use, about you by seeing hair. Because we usually talk about emotions with the portrayal of eyes. So I, I just wanted to know how the hair is so significant in your painting. So I think you became well, the eyes is, So the Stonehenge picture, the two kids are under the, the cover. But if you see, I painted their eyes very light. So it's the yeah. first thing you see. We communicate through eyes, don't we? Yes. Well, so I try to mimic that in my paintings by having the figures communicate with eyes. I very often, it's a bit of a trick, have somebody in a painting that's looking straight at you. Yeah, I, I noticed that. That means you're I inside the painting. Yes, it, they're all very wonderful. I absolutely Thank loved you. all of them. Thank you. In the nice to speak Thank to you so uh, all these faraway places as well. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much, you. Dania, and all Thank the you. best in your you. uh, studies towards art yeah. and in its many facets. But, you know, all this talk that we were just talking about hair, uh, I was just watching a documentary on the nuns from Zanskar. Yeah, uh -huh. and I uh, the nuns... Um, the Buddhist nuns from Zanskar. And I really, I, I will post the link on the group. It's such a, a moving uh, story about these 11 nuns who've never been outside the Zanskar area, which lies in Jammu and Kashmir. And they think of India as a different country. Okay, so they say, oh, so uh, what, the researcher, she says, you know, I promise you to take you all across India so that you can see the world. And why I mentioned the Buddhist nuns is that one of them was asked a question. They were shaving their heads before their travel, their four month travel, and they had never traveled traveled you know in order to travel they have to cross this frozen river it's called the Chadar trek uh, and it's cut off most of the year when it's frozen that's the only time you can exit that area and she says oh why uh, you know shaving it's it's cold it's winters and you need your hair they said no 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 we have to shave it off because when others see us they will think that we are not good nuns you know and a phase of them when they become nuns you know parting with their hair you know, liberating. So this whole emphasis on um, on hair is very important. And I remember one of my friends, when she cut her, she had very long hair. When she cut her hair till here, she suddenly felt like a different person. It changes your personality. And the fact that you can uh, show that through your paintings, this the, the hairstyle can uh, uh, tell so much about the demeanor of the person is amazing because it truly well is. There's a, there's a theory in uh, European uh, prehistoric archaeology that um, taking care of your body came in with the warriors that sort of invaded in the, in the Bronze Age because we see combs and we see shavers, erasers appear. So we think that they were very precise in, uh, in, in what they tried to present themselves as. And what they also had, they had long hair, which sometimes they had in tresses, uh, we think. And they had long hair. There's, there's some very well-preserved bodies from Denmark, which are about 1400, 1300 to 1100 uh, um, uh, uh, BCE. Um, and they have long blonde hair that they have parted in the middle and then pulled behind their ears so it could stay long, so it doesn't fall in front of your face. And so we think that the whole idea that we know, you know, Conan the Barbarians, the warrior with the long hair, that that actually comes from European prehistory, that concept. The warrior has long hair. And uh, uh, Vivaji talks about, you know, hair is equated with sexuality. And I agree with it. Like with the Ababda nomads in Egypt, for example, uh, there is a dance that they do where uh, the women, they kind of uh, loosen their hair uh, and um, they have their, have their head, uh, hair loose and they turn their backs. And, you know, again, this is where hijab is followed. You know, men are not supposed to see the women. Yeah, but they yeah. turn their backs and they have their hair loose and the, the men are dancing with their swords and the women are, you know, have their hair, you know, just moving like the snake, you know, basically enticing them. And yeah, that's yeah, yeah. when they choose their partners. So, um, yeah, and Viva is uh, further adding that 
Traditionally, among some Naga communities, the girl child kept shaven hair, prepubescent girls kept short hair, and only after marriage they could grow their hair. Yeah. What we, we know, we know hair, hair is like a costume. Um, and there's lots that we do know, and uh, lots, sorry, lots that we don't know, and a few things that we do know. But from all of that, you can take from it that hair was like a costume. It's, uh, yeah. It means something. I think I should invite Jolanda on uh, hair. I was actually surprised that she's not on because she was supposed to. Uh, I yeah. thought she might have listened yeah. to whatever. Yeah. About Egyptian hair. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Egyptian hair, Indian hair. Oh my God, there's so many. So, yeah. uh, but yes, uh, this has been uh, truly inspiring, enlightening, and uh, every uh, nice adjective that we can find uh, is uh, dedicated to you today, Kelvin. Uh, thanks so much for doing this talk and I hope uh, you accept my invitation and come to the Himalayas and perhaps do a workshop. Uh, uh, tomorrow, okay. <laughs> okay, so yeah. before we part, do you have any words of wisdom for us? And before you do that, a couple of announcements. So those of you who do not follow our page and you would like to follow our page, if, you're, if you love the highest mountains in the world, uh, follow the Himalayan Institute of Cultural and Heritage Studies. And we have our YouTube channel and all of that. And um, uh, we are based in this little hamlet in the Himalayas uh, between Kulu and Manali in a place called Katrain. Uh, so please do come there, uh, pay us a visit. And there are stories of Alexander the Great there and or the silk route, the trade route. And there's so many myths. So if you want to be a part of them, uh, do join us and keep connected. Uh, uh, with our wonderful talks uh, like we had one here today and um, we have a talk on ethnobotany soon and I'll be talking on pottery soon this month is the month for material culture so yes Kelvin over to you your words, of wisdom, words of wisdom before Actually, we I, I would have said I would so is somebody asking a question mm -hmm. no um I've just, I've just put in a lot of emphasis on research. I mean, a lot of people here might be thinking, well, what I've shown today is about painting. It's not. It's about laying down research. You will all enjoy it. Research is great, but research can take you in a million different ways. I just happen to veer off into how do you express this vis visually or what does it mean once you've expressed it visually? but I can't do it without the other inroads that all of you are taking. So I need what the textile experts have written. I need what the anthropologists have written. I need to read these things about, I mean, I'm here something about Naga com uh, communities and shave and hair. That is very interesting to me to know that those things are there. If I didn't know those things were there, there's nothing I could garner my in brackets knowledge from. I'm just a vessel but then I happen to be one with a paintbrush. Thank you all. Thank you so much. And we can bid our bye-byes and see uh, you all next uh, Sunday. Many of us were missing here today because uh, there was some uh, obituary for uh, Kapila Vatsayan today. Uh, so a lot of them went that way and I got a lot of apologies. So I'm sure a lot more people will be watching your uh, talk on YouTube. Okay. So. Thank you and have a wonderful uh, uh, day, evening, night ahead. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Sonali. Thank you very much for this. Thank Two and you. a half hours of fun. Yeah. Total, total fun and total inspiration. Fun. Total fun Thank and you. inspiration. <laughs> I think I should be the last one to switch off. So I'm going to stay here until yeah. you've all said goodbye. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Sonali. Thank, and thanks, thank you, Kelvin. Sonali. That was fantastic. Thank you. Lovely. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> Bye. Bye, thank everyone. Everybody. Bye. Bye. So I'll, I'm going to switch, end the meeting. So we'll all... Oh, yeah, you do that. Yeah. Okay. Bye, I'll speak to you later. Yeah, bye. Bye.